In the last scenes of a very famous movie, the lost Ark of the Covenant, the box that once held the Ten Commandments, is crated and abandoned in the basement of a warehouse. What if Hollywood's depiction accurately reflects reality? This would mean that hiding somewhere, there is tangible proof of the story the Bible calls the Exodus, the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, led by the prophet Moses. Well, right here in this building, there's a 3,500-year-old gold image carved, perhaps by an eyewitness to the biblical Exodus, of the lost Ark of the Covenant. And the people in there don't realize it. Exodus. For thousands of years, the biblical epic has captured the human imagination. But did it really happen? When it's a Wyndham, I know it's going to be great. Wyndham Garden is my go-to for work trips. They take all the stress out of travel. Good morning. The kids, they love staying at Wyndham Grand. Family vacations, you'll find us right here. And when I need a weekend away, Wyndham has girls' trip written all over it. Exceptional stays for business, for family, for fun. Your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Grandpa, when I found the bird, I prayed. Grandpa, you made this poor little guy, so maybe you could help him out. It's hard as in beating Sarah and Zed. Then, I saw God standing on the other side of the lake. I always thought that you were kind of special. You see him? Who? God. You saw God and then brought a dead bird back to life. No, I didn't. God did. Where'd you get this? I drew it when I came home tonight. You drew this? Yeah. It just sounds like she has a healthy imagination to me. She would never outright lie. My cat died last week. I was wondering if you could stop by and bring it back to life. Mom, it really was God. Sarah, do you think you can help me walk again? I don't know. Could you say a prayer for me? So, tell me what this medical emergency is all about. I moved my toes this morning. I can't explain what, what happened in there. Severed nerves and spinal cord can't regenerate. Mom? I thought he was what? never supposed to walk again. He wasn't. It was Sarah. I keep fighting voices in my mind. It's not healthy or fair to other people to pretend that you're actually having conversations with God. I'm not pretending. Is Sarah Hopkins a miracle worker? It's about to turn her world upside down. I don't think I can take this much excitement. Yeah, hold on to your hat. There's going to be a lot more of it. Dad? I think these people want to see Sarah. Thank you. I know that I was seeing God. Everything Sarah told us was true. I'm just a lucky girl who God decided to visit. The truth is, all you have to do is believe in God and pray to Him. He's listening. This mother is just sweeter than chocolate. It's impossible. You 
beginning to catch on. When it comes to the Exodus, we have no evidence that it happened and a good deal of evidence that it didn't. They made it up. Under 150 feet of sand and rock, they discovered the ancient tomb of Ben Tempe. Something must have happened. I can't explain what happened, but it shaped ancient Israel's identity, and therefore I can't dismiss it as a a fairy tale. In the famed Valley of the Kings, where 60 Egyptian pharaohs were buried midst the splendor the world has never equaled. Archaeologists, what can you dig up which is going to prove the exodus? What, what would you have to find in order to prove the exodus? The exodus story is at the very heart of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. For thousands of years, believers have treated it as historical fact. But in the past few decades, scholars have called the story a fairy tale. I'm James Cameron, and I know a filmmaker who for nearly a decade has been on a mission to answer a 3,000-year-old question. Is the Exodus fact or fiction? His name is Simka Yakubovich, and he's a two-time Emmy winner in investigative journalism. He claims that scholars have missed the archaeological evidence that's hiding in plain sight. More than that, he seems to have come up with the goods by putting together the long forgotten pieces of the ultimate archaeological mystery. How did we do it? By tracking down experts from a variety of disciplines who rarely, if ever, talk to each other. None of them fully subscribes to our take on the story but many possess critical pieces of the puzzle. And what emerges will challenge even the most skeptical. But before we show you the evidence, let's start the story at the beginning. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London, or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you, just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. The biblical tale begins when the Hebrew patriarch Jacob escapes drought in the land of Canaan, modern Israel, and moves to the land of plenty, the land of the pyramids, ancient Egypt. There, Jacob's clan, the future Israelites, flourish in their new environment. In fact, Jacob's son, Joseph, became as powerful as the rulers of Egypt, the pharaohs. And yet, after Joseph dies, his people are enslaved by the ruling Egyptians. More than a century later, the Egyptians became afraid of revolution and instituted a policy of drowning all the Israelite male infants. It was at this point that Jacob's great-great-grandson was born. To avoid death, the infant was hidden in the bulrushes, where he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. The princess adopted him and named him Moses. When Moses grew up, he sided with his oppressed brethren and fled into the desert. Sixty years later, 
he returned to utter the unforgettable cry, let my people go. Ten times Pharaoh said no to Moses, and ten times God struck Egypt with catastrophic plagues, ultimately killing all Egyptian firstborn males. Finally, Pharaoh let the Israelites go, but then changed his mind and pursued Moses and his followers to the edge of the sea. It looked like the Israelites were trapped. But then the impossible happened. The sea parted and the Israelites crossed to safety. Moses now led his followers to Mount Sinai, where they received the Ten Commandments, the sacred laws they would take with them to the Promised Land. Most scholars believe the story is a myth. So even when the evidence is staring them in the face, they ignore it. The most dramatic example of this took place in 1947, when archaeologist Henri Chevrier found pieces of a broken stone monument, or stella, dating to a pharaoh named Achmose, around 1500 before the Common Era, or BCE. Incredibly, the Achmose stella is covered in hieroglyphic inscriptions that mirror the biblical tale. Today, it lies abandoned in the basement of the Cairo Museum, and all our attempts to get access to it were unsuccessful. So using Chevrier's published description, we reconstructed the stella and got one of the world's leading Egyptologists to comment on it. We have this very interesting stela, uh, which is dated to the reign of Ahmasi. It records a tremendous catastrophe that happened to Egypt. We're not quite clear what it was, but it involved rain and thunder and lightning and, and a, 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 such a storm that uh, rarely happens in Northeast Africa. I mean, that's a dry area. It sounds peculiar to me that the biblical tradition preserves the memory of plagues, you know, which involve climatic cataclysms. And here we have, from the very time, this curious stela. This curious stela may in fact hold the key to the Exodus enigma. Let's take a closer look. The Bible says that at the time of the Exodus, there was a great storm. Achmose Stella also talks of a great storm. The Bible says darkness descended on Egypt. The Stella says that Egypt was enveloped in darkness. The Stella then says something very peculiar. Though the Egyptians worshipped many gods, on this Stella it is written that the storm and the darkness happened when God, in the singular, manifested His power. The Bible describes Pharaoh, but never names him. Because of this Stella, we now know his name. Achmose. And now that we know who he is, maybe it's time that we met him. This is the Cairo Museum, home to some of the most famous mummies ever unearthed. We came here in search of Pharaoh Achmose, the man who we believe is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. You want to flash that thing? Normally. At first, we couldn't locate him, but we did locate his father, 2nd Henry Tau II. If we are right, this is one of the pharaohs who oppressed the Israelites. According to most scholars, his skull had been crushed by enemy axes. Perhaps those enemies were Israelites, smashing his mummy as they left on the Exodus. We continued on our search for Achmose. It was hard to locate him because he had been sort of misfiled. But we did locate one of his two wives under some debris in one of the museum's workshops. Hi, is it possible to reveal the, uh, the wife of Achmose? 
According to our calculations, this somewhat discarded glass coffin contains the mummy of a woman whose husband contended with Moses and hardened his heart to God himself. At last we located Pharaoh Achmose. Here is the man who confronted Moses. Can it be that Achmose's father remembered the Israelite prince he grew up with, and when he gave his son his Egyptian name, Achmose, the moon is born, he chose the name because of a play on words. In Hebrew, Achmose means the brother of Moses. In history, Pharaoh Achmose is most famous for expelling a foreign nation from Egypt around 1500 BCE. At the time, Egypt was ruled by a people that the ancients called Hyksos. Until recently, little was known about the Hyksos. Then, in the 1960s, their ancient capital, Avaris, was discovered north of Cairo. No one has ever been allowed to film at Avaris. To get there, we needed the cooperation of the Egyptian authorities. They're concerned that in the volatile Middle East, the discovery of biblical artifacts will somehow strengthen modern Israel's claims in the area. As a result, the exodus is a touchy subject in Egypt today. So we didn't mention Moses, and we stressed that we were interested in Pharaoh Achmose and the Hyksos he drove out of Egypt. After months of negotiations, we were finally given permits to shoot at Avaris. Indeed. This is Avaris a walled city dominated by palaces. 3,500 years ago, it was surrounded by branches of the Nile. Avaris was discovered by Professor Manfred Bitak of the University of Vienna. Although only a few acres are exposed today, in ancient times, Avaris seems to have dominated the area. Avaris itself uh, was much bigger, it was uh, 250 hectares, so it extended from here uh, to the east uh, about two kilometers, and from here to the south, perhaps even one kilometer. In the Hyksos period, this was uh, one of the major residences uh, of Egyptian pharaohs. Egyptian history clearly states that the Hyksos, who ruled mighty Avaris, were Semites like the Israelites and that they left on a mass exodus, known as the Hyksos Expulsion. We have in the Bible the story of the Semites leaving Egypt and going eastward from Egypt. At the same time, independent of the Bible, we have a story of the Hyksos being expelled from Egypt. I think definitely the two stories are related. They're describing the same event from different viewpoints. If the Hyksos expulsion and the biblical exodus are really one and the same event, then perhaps we can find the long sought after proof for the biblical exodus during the Hyksos period. But most scholars say that the Hyksos and the Israelites cannot be equated because the Hyksos left Egypt hundreds of years before Moses was born. These scholars also say that the chronology of ancient Egypt cannot be tampered with. 
You can play with Egyptian dates. You can move them up maybe 10 years and down 10 years, but you can't move up, up and down 50 or 100 years. That's not possible. And yet many people try to do that. They try to adjust chronology to fit their predetermined notion of biblical history. You can't do it. But maybe we have to. What if scholars are placing the Exodus in the wrong time period? Imagine the confusion if in the future, scholars date World War II to the 1990s. You'll never find any evidence that it actually happened. Currently, most scholars date the Exodus to 1270 BCE during the reign of Pharaoh Ramses II. But some scholars are now breaking with that consensus. The Bible gives information that would put the Exodus about 480 years before the early years of Solomon in the middle of the 15th century BC. Professor Bimson's calculations move the Exodus from its present date to 1470 BCE, less than 100 years from the traditional date for the Hyksos expulsion. These are too close to write off as a coincidence. So we have a new date for the Exodus, approximately 1500 BCE. The Hyksos and the Hyksos expulsion is what we're talking about when we are talking about the Exodus. All right, our new date for the Exodus is 1500 BC. And we know from the Bible that the Israelites arrived in Egypt some 200 years before their Exodus. In the original Hebrew, the Bible calls the Israelites God's people, or Amo Israel. If we write about our dates, there should be hard archeological evidence for the arrival of these Amo around 1700 BCE. Four hundred kilometers south of Avaris is the tomb at Beni Hassan. It dates to 1700 BCE. Because no one has looked for evidence of the Exodus in this period, the tomb has never been linked to the biblical story. And yet, there is a perfectly preserved wall painting here that records an ancient migration into Egypt from the area of modern Israel. As in the Bible, the scene involves bearded Semites, riding donkeys, and bringing their families and flocks into Egypt. Like the biblical Israelites, they are wearing multicolored tunics. The hieroglyphic inscription on this wall calls these people the Amo, God's people. Looking in the right place during the right time, we are the first to recognize a veritable snapshot of the migration of the biblical Israelites to Egypt. The Bible records that at the time of their arrival, one Israelite rose to the highest levels of Egyptian power. His name was Joseph, son of Yaakov, Jacob in English. And he became so powerful that he wore on his finger the seal of royal authority. Discovering Joseph's seal at Avaris would prove that the Israelites arrived here exactly when our timeline predicts. That would be like finding a needle in a 3,700-year-old archaeological haystack. Incredibly, the tiny seal was found, precisely at the archaeological layer we anticipated. In fact, Professor Manfred Bitak found no less than nine seals worn by Joseph's court officials. Inscribed right on them is the Hebrew name Yaakov, J 
Joseph's father. It's very strange that we found nine seals with the name Jakob here. It's a biblical name, by the way. The original was probably mounted on a ring worn on the finger. And uh, this gives us a, a new puzzle. Is it really a puzzle? Not if one uses our chronology. This is the only time that a Hebrew name appears on an Egyptian royal seal. It directly connects Avaris with the Bible. But Professor Bitak steers clear of biblical chronology. He's under the constant watch of the Egyptian antiquities authority, who have made Avaris off limits to the public. Supposedly for conservation reasons, Professor Bitak has been forced to cover up his dig every single year. The area is then plowed, seeded, and cultivated by local farmers. No one would suspect that underneath these fields lies an archaeological treasure trove that proves the biblical exodus. Now that we found hard evidence for the arrival of the Israelites in Egypt and their rise to power, we went searching for archaeological proof of their downfall and the slavery that led to the Exodus. In search of the evidence, we had to travel to a place called Serabit el Khadem, 400 kilometers south of the Nile Delta into the Sinai Desert. For thousands of years, Egyptians mined turquoise in this area. Often they used slave labor. The ancient turquoise mines are off the beaten tourist track. The only ones who know their way in this area are the Bedouins, who still live at the foot of the mines. I heard once that the Bedouin, they can do like uh, the Prophet Musa, that they know which rocks have water in them. They break it. Uh, is that true? Ah. We got here, paid our respects to the local sheikh, and recruited one of his sons to show us the way. Okay, let's go. We learned of this place from old papers published in obscure journals. We came here to find proof of the slaves that Moses led to freedom. But even if we found evidence for the presence of slaves, how could we be sure that they were Israelites? The Bible provides us with two clues. First, the followers of Moses did not use hieroglyphic writing like the Egyptians. Rather, the biblical tradition states that they used an early form of alphabetic writing. Also, the Israelites did not worship Egyptian gods, but a single god that the Bible calls El. To support our new biblical timeline, we needed to find alphabetic inscriptions carved by slaves some 3,500 years ago. In our wildest dreams, they would also mention the biblical god, El. And sure enough, there are slave inscriptions here, and one of them records a 3,500-year-old cry. El, save me. This is the writing of a slave, a slave who worked in this mine. You can still see the chisel marks, which were part of the forced labor that the author of this inscription was involved in. And he wrote his cry to God, saying, help me, don't forget me, here where he worked and he slept and he probably died. And it represents an incredible moment in human history. Not only is it the first inscription that records the name of God, El, but it also records the oldest, or maybe the second oldest, alphabetic inscription. It's the basis on which Hebrew 
Aramaic, Greek, Latin, English, Arabic, all is based on this writing. Pretty incredible that after all these years, we would be here to record this man's cry. Yachmos Estela, the Beni Hassan tomb paintings, Joseph's royal seal, and the Israelite slavery inscriptions all point to approximately 1500 BCE as the date for Moses and the Exodus. If our date is correct, then there's something else that we have to factor in. Around 1500 BCE, people living along the Mediterranean experienced one of the most cataclysmic events in history the eruption of the Santorini volcano in modern Greece. This eruption may be another crucial clue for decoding the biblical exodus. This is the island of Santorini, 700 kilometers from the Egyptian coast across the Mediterranean. It is literally the mouth of a volcano. Some 3,500 years ago, Santorini was destroyed by one of the worst volcanic eruptions in human history. When it erupted, the volcano essentially brought to an end the Minoan civilization that once flourished here. It sent an ash cloud that measured some 40 kilometers straight up and 200 kilometers across. The sound of the eruption circled the Earth some 10 to 12 times. To put this in perspective, an eruption like Sanatoridi would be hundreds to thousands of times stronger, more explosive than the atom bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The energy of that eruption was so immense, you would have had these huge explosions that were happening and you'd hear crack, crack, crack. For hundreds of kilometers, people around were listening to it. We were getting earthquakes, probably magnitude three, four, maybe even five or higher that were happening extremely rapidly. And it would have been, I'm sure, to the people living there as if the world was coming to an end. So perhaps the cataclysmic events described in the Bible, such as plagues, darkness, and the parting of a sea, are somehow connected to the Santorini eruption. But like all things related to the Exodus, dating the Santorini eruption to 1500 BCE can be controversial. People have been arguing about the dates of Santorini. Volcanologists and geologists would date the eruption in the 1600s BC. Archaeologists tend to date it in the 1500s BC. Digging at Avaris, Professor Bitak has no doubt that he can pinpoint the Santorini eruption to the exact time period where we place the exodus. Here, pumice from the Santorini eruption appears for the first time. So from archaeological point of view, it looks very much as if the eruption happened early in the 18th dynasty, let us say around 1500 BC. Jakubowicz's chronology machine has now synchronized a pharaoh named Ahmose, the Hyksos expulsion, the Exodus, and the Santorini eruption. It appears that the Exodus code has finally been cracked. If Jakubowicz is right, we can now explain the science underlying the biblical story. can even explain what caused the greatest miracle of them all, the parting of the Red Sea. We can then trace the biblical map and discover the real Mount Sinai, where the Exodus story came to a climax, when Moses received the Ten Commandments and placed them in the now lost Ark of the Covenant.
Let's begin with the plagues, the biblical catastrophes that struck Egypt because Pharaoh wouldn't let the Israelite slaves go. Until now, no one has come up with a comprehensive scientific explanation for all 10 plagues. The answer began to take shape for us after we returned to the Achmos Estela and discovered an amazing synchronicity with the biblical text. The Bible says that the God of Israel has judgment on the gods of Egypt. And the Stella confirms that the statues of the gods of Egypt were toppled to the ground. Earthquakes are known to accompany volcanic eruptions like Santorini. It seems that the Stella and the Bible are describing the results of an earthquake, or more precisely, what scientists now call an earthquake storm. Earthquake storms are uh, sequences of large earthquakes that sweep across a large areas. And the best examples are the Eastern Mediterranean, where we have long historical and archaeological records. As it turns out, the biblical story takes place in an earthquake zone. The Nile Delta, where the Bible says the exodus took place, is crisscrossed by fault lines. To the east, the Great Rift Fault separating the Asian and African plates runs through the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, and the Red Sea, all the way to Africa. In addition, there is a fault line that runs along the modern Suez Canal and another fault line that runs along the Nile Delta under ancient Avaris. Meanwhile, some 700 kilometers to the west, the rift between the African plate and the European plate runs practically under Santorini. But what do earthquakes have to do with the biblical plagues? Well, let's begin with the first plague. Earthquakes can't possibly explain how Moses turned the Nile's waters into blood. Can they? In fact, they can, when they trigger gas leaks. And we don't have to go back 3,500 years to prove the point. In 1984 at Lake Manu, and in 1986 at Lake Nios, both in Cameroon, the sweet, clear lake waters suddenly turned blood red. The mystery was solved when Professor George Kling explained the phenomenon in terms of an underground gas leak. What was happening was that the bottom waters contained very high concentrations of iron, dissolved iron. And when that was mixed up to the surface, when the gas was released, it contacted oxygen and it formed an iron hydroxide, essentially rust, the same thing that happens on cars. And that rust was what caused the reddish, brownish color at the surface of the lake. When it comes to the biblical plagues along the Nile Delta there, there are many elements that are present that, that could suggest a buildup of gas. Um, so we could have a situation where gas beneath the, the earth is trapped in pockets, and earthquakes along the fault line then release that gas. And depending on the kind of water that that gas goes through, it could even turn that water red. If the Nile turned blood red, as a result of a gas leak, then the chain of events described in the Bible would have been set into motion. The first thing that happens in such circumstances is that the water becomes devoid of oxygen and all living things in it die. The fish then begin to float in the polluted waters, rotting in the sun. The only things that do not die are frogs. Unlike fish, they can hop out. And as it turns out, biblical plague number two is a frog infestation. The lack of clean water then leads to lice, flies, and bacterial epidemics among humans and domestic animals. 
Not surprisingly, biblical plague number three is lice. Plague number four is flies. And plague number five is an epidemic. Plague six is boils and blisters, man and beast. Can an earthquake-induced gas leak explain this kind of outbreak? Let's go back to the 1986 disaster at Lake Nios, Cameroon. At the time, people living along the lake developed strange boils and burns. It turns out that carbon dioxide mixed with air put people into a kind of coma, reducing circulation to the skin, causing the kind of boils described in the Bible as plague number six. Despite the first six plagues, the Bible records that Pharaoh still refused to let the Israelite slaves go. So Egypt was now struck by plague number seven, hail. And it was a very unusual hail, involving ice and fire mixed together. To this day, rabbis teach that the biblical description is no metaphor. The seventh plague was the plague of hail but the Bible describes hail in a very unique manner. The hail was together with ash, with fire. The idea being that the fire and the ice commingled together, they coexisted together. The Bible then describes God as making a miracle within a miracle, taking opposites in nature and having them coexist together. Incredibly, there is an Egyptian papyrus that tells the exact same story. It's called the Ipawar Papyrus, and it's dated by many scholars to the Hyksos period. The Ipawar Papyrus specifically states that Egypt was struck by a strange hail made up of ice and fire mingled together. Another piece of the puzzle has fallen into place. It now seems clear that the biblical and Egyptian texts are describing what scientists call Accretionary lapilli, volcanic hail that could only have come from the earthquake induced Santorini volcano. When the ash cloud goes up to, to great distances in the stratosphere, essentially what happens is you have moisture in the atmosphere. You also have a lot of water vapor in the cloud itself. So the small fragments of ash and crystals actually form a nucleus, something very similar to a hailstone. In other words, Egypt experienced fire and ice raining from above, just as the Bible describes. It seems that earthquakes and the resulting volcanic and gas eruptions neatly explain the first seven biblical plagues. They also explain plague number eight, locusts. Locusts migrate in swarms. There can be between 40 and 80 million adult locusts in each square kilometer. Cold weather produces a drop in their body temperature and makes them land en masse. The volcanic hail and the weather disruptions caused by the Santorini eruption would have forced great clouds of locusts, which are common in this part of the world, to suddenly land in Egypt. As the hailstorm cleared and the temperature rose, so did the locusts, exactly as the biblical account describes. Gripped by earthquake storms and their consequences, the Egyptians were now going to experience the last phase of the Santorini eruption, or what the Bible calls plague number nine, darkness. This is the way it probably worked. During the months before the eruption, seismic activity in the whole eastern Mediterranean was causing the African plate to grind under the European plate. Seawater was then turned to steam that bubbled up through the magma. This in turn caused pressure to build and erupt through weak points on the surface 
triggering several small eruptions, leading to a major blowout. When the final eruption came, it created an ash cloud almost 40 kilometers from top to bottom and 200 kilometers across. When the ash cloud reached the Nile Delta, it engulfed the Egyptians in what the Bible calls a palpable darkness. In a matter of a few minutes, they're plunged into a black world. Ash is falling around them. They can't see, they can't breathe very well. The sun has disappeared. You have black overhead, and they have no idea what's going to happen next. The discovery of Santorini pumice at Avaris seems to prove the arrival of the ash cloud in Egypt and explains the biblical description of a prolonged darkness. Some might argue that since pumice can float, it could have been brought to Egypt by waves and washed ashore by tides. So we caught up with Professor Jean Daniel Stanley of the Smithsonian Institute. He's made the definitive discovery. He found Santorini ash in the Nile Delta. It could only have arrived in the ash cloud that plunged Egypt into the biblical darkness. We had to look through 10 to 20,000 grains to find one ash grain. So we found a total of 40 ash grains. Not all ash looks the same. Ash has a fingerprint aspect. The ash particles that we find in the northern and northeastern Nile Delta are individual grains that came in from Santorini. There's very little room for doubt that the Exodus account and the descriptions that we have in Egypt of this, uh, the volcanic dust coming into Egypt and geological description where we can actually see, feel, touch, and date the, uh, the volcanic dust in the Nile, that they are describing the same tremendous volcanic event. The final plague took place at midnight after Moses ordered the Israelites to sit down to what became known as the first Passover meal. While the Israelites were involved in the Passover ritual, the Egyptians slept. And then it happened. Every firstborn male Egyptian died. Every house was affected. No one has ever been able to offer a plausible scientific explanation for the death of the firstborn, until now. According to our scenario, at this point in the sequence of events that began some six months earlier, the gas leak that set the chain of plagues in motion would have finally erupted. Carbon dioxide would have seeped to the surface and being heavier than air, would have killed animals and sleeping people before it dissipated harmlessly into the atmosphere. In case you think all this is conjecture, consider this. It happened in exactly the same way in 1986 at Lake Nios, Cameroon. On the fateful night of August 21st, the villagers at Nios went to sleep. They couldn't have known that the carbon dioxide gas which had turned the lake blood red, was now reaching a critical point. As the people of Lake Neo slept, the top of the lake was keeping the carbon down like a cap on a pop bottle. But then, the earth rumbled and a landslide took place, sending rock into the water, disturbing the surface pressure and releasing the gas. The gas then rose to the surface and like some alien monster emerged from the water, droplets forming on it, turning the invisible gas into a visible fog. The fog then rolled across the water and across the land, suffocating everything in its path. And as suddenly as it appeared, it disappeared dissolving harmlessly into the atmosphere. The next day, 
those who had been sleeping on higher ground woke up to find some 1,800 people dead. Hundreds of cattle and small animals also dead. All around, there was deathly silence. I was sitting, just sitting among the dead people. Inside the house, some of them were outside. Animals everywhere, lying, cows, dogs, everything. All the family, we were 56, but 53 died. After the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh finally relented, letting Moses take his people out of Egypt. According to the Bible, what made Pharaoh give up was the selectivity of the death. The fact that it was only male firstborn who died. It was this selectivity that demonstrated to him that God himself was involved. How can we account for this? Well, Egyptian firstborn males had a privileged position. They were the heirs to the throne, to property, title, and more. They slept on Egyptian beds low to the ground, while their brothers and sisters slept on rooftops, sheds, and in wagons. The Israelites sitting up at their first Passover meal did not feel a thing, while the low traveling gas suffocated the privileged Egyptian males sleeping in their beds. This conclusion is backed by the archaeology. At Avaris, Professor Manfred Bitak has found mass graves dating to before and during our date for the Exodus. The earlier graves are classic examples of ancient epidemics that killed men, women, and children. But at the time of the Exodus, the mass grave he found has only males in it. Here you see bones of burials from the early 18th dynasty. They are all male victims. By the size of the graves and the number of the individuals in the graves, we think people died in rapid succession. And uh, the individuals were just thrown into the pit, uh, some of them lying on their stomach, some lying on their side. Some of the pits were just uh, 20 centimeters deep and uh, just some dust uh, put on top of them. The Bible says that Pharaoh's son also died during the plague of the firstborn. Since we claim that Achmose is the Pharaoh of the Exodus, we should be able to prove that Achmose's son died young. Searching in the Cairo Museum. He's right over there on the shelf there. We found Achmose's son. The prince had died young. He was only 12. For the first time ever, we can put a face and a name to a victim of the biblical plagues. It seems that the Bible, geology, and archaeology are all telling the same story. But skeptics, who would like to regard the Exodus as myth, might resist the idea that it actually happened. Because this would imply that God does indeed exist. Believers, on the other hand, may feel that a scientific explanation of the biblical story takes God out of the equation. But in the book of Exodus, God does not suspend nature. He manipulates it. In other words, According to the Bible, we should be able to understand the science behind the miracles. 
And the greatest miracle of them all was the parting of the sea. After the death of the Egyptian firstborn males, Pharaoh let the Israelites go. He then changed his mind and pursued them, finding them trapped on the shores of a sea. The Hebrew text calls this sea Yam Suf, and it was here where the miracle occurred. The sea parted, the Israelites crossed to safety, and then the waters came back, swallowing the entire Egyptian army, overturning chariots, drowning all the horses and soldiers. Explorers have searched for evidence of the miracle of the parting of the sea. They've mounted underwater archaeological quests, looking for ancient chariots, swords, and any evidence of drowned Egyptian armies. There is a theory that a huge subsurface shelf in the Red Sea could have been exposed for a short time during a powerful storm, providing a land bridge for the Israelites to cross. But the search has always been unsuccessful. Who would have thought that instead of diving, we should have been driving? That's because Yam Suf, Hebrew for the place where Moses parted the waters, has for years been mistranslated as Red Sea, when in fact the correct translation is Reed Sea. And reeds grow in sweet water, not salt water, in lakes, not oceans. We should have been looking for a lake. But which lake is the Bible referring to? when it describes the parting of the Reed Sea. It goes like this. Oh, like that, like almost like a figure eight. Yes. You know what I mean? Using our dates for the Exodus, we track down an ancient artifact that records the precise location of Yam Suf. It also provides us with the first archaeological evidence for the parting of the sea. we found a hieroglyphic inscription oh, yeah. on a granite monument that tells the entire story of the Exodus from Pharaoh's point of view. The Bible calls Moses a king. On this stone, Moses is called the prince of the desert. The Bible calls the Israelites God's people. The granite calls them the evil ones. And then, the granite corroborates the miracle of the parting of the sea. The symbol can be read by anyone. Three waves and two knives, the parted sea. The three water signs, one on top of the other, is typically used to apply to different types of bodies of water. It can apply to the Nile, can apply to a marsh, can apply to the sea. But what is not so common is when you have that word in combination with these two knives. The fact that you have these two knives uh, associated with it would suggest that this is water that is cut, water that is, that is divided. This might be an allusion to the waters that the Red Sea or the Reed Sea were divided in Exodus chapter 14. Oh, I see it. To examine the text better, we got a pressing of the hieroglyphic. And as it turns out, the Egyptian text doesn't just mention the parting of the sea. This is the best one. You see the two knives. It also mentions a specific location next to where the sea parted. The place is called Pi Haroti. And today, archaeologists know exactly where it was, enabling us to locate Yam Suf, the place where the Bible states the sea parted. The Israelites crossed to safety, and 
human history was changed forever. It's an ancient lake that survived until the 1850s. When the Suez Canal was put in, this ancient lake finally died. <laughs> Professor Mantra Bitak, after conducting thorough study of this, this area, proposed that this lake was known to the Egyptians as Patufi, the, the marshland, the marshy sea. And the word tuf, Egyptian word for reeds, is the same word as suf in Hebrew. So that Yam Suf, he suggested, was a name derived from this body of water. Now, it's called the Al Balakh Lake. Under the ever watchful eye of the Egyptian authorities, we traveled to Lake El Bala, the exact spot where one of the greatest biblical miracles is supposed to have taken place. The salt beds and reeds testify to the fact that at one time, the salty waters of the Mediterranean and the sweet waters of Lake El Bala intermingled here. Behind me is what's left of Lake Bala. You can see the salt marshes, you can see the reeds. This whole entire area was one big lake or sea. But because of the Suez Canal, today, you can literally walk or drive through the sea of reeds. One of the problems most people have today is they pull out a map and they try to find out where were these places that the Bible's talking about. But you can't use a modern day map. You have to use a map that's 3,000 years older. And we are working on this by taking satellite images where we can actually see the depressions from ancient lakes. And so we can actually begin to understand what the northeastern delta of Egypt was like 3,500 years ago. Identifying the precise location of Yamsuf means that we can finally explain the miracle of the parting of the sea. This satellite photo clearly demonstrates that Lake El Bala is close to the edge of the Nile Delta, where silt accumulates and collapses from time to time. As Pharaoh chased the Israelites to the shores of Lake El Bala, the extreme seismic activity that caused the 10 plagues and the Santorini eruption would have now caused the Delta to start sliding into the Eastern Mediterranean. And as millions of tons of soil moved forward, the edge of the African plate, which had now been released from its burden, must have risen between one and one and a half meters. In other words, the sea parted. Water would have cascaded from higher ground to lower ground and drained from pools and sinkholes creating dry land for the Israelites to cross. At this point, further seismic activity or another collapse of the delta would have sent a major tsunami crashing against the coast. We get some glimpse of these tidal waves uh, in Turkey where they carved out channeled scab lands. 30 miles inland, and in order to do that at the shore, they would have had to be more than half as high, these waves, as the Empire State Building. And that's exactly the description that we do have in the Bible. If the tsunami went a mere 12 kilometers inland, it would have reached Lake El Bala and engulfed the Egyptian army. By this point, according to the Bible, the Israelites had advanced beyond the reach of the waves. As it turns out, some of the people that followed Moses across the parted sea and later to Mount Sinai did not follow him to the Promised Land. They boarded ships 
and sailed in an unknown exodus to Greece. Why hasn't anyone noticed? Because no one thought to look in Greece for evidence of an event that happened in Egypt. In fact, until recently, there was very little archaeological evidence of contact between the Minoan civilization of ancient Greece and Egypt at the time of Moses. All that changed with two great discoveries. The first was in 1972, when digging under the ash at Santorini, archaeologists made a startling discovery, linking this area of the world with the Exodus. They found unusual Minoan-style wall paintings. Incredibly, among them there is a map depicting an ancient journey from Egypt to Greece. The whole scene may be considered as uh, the earliest, the oldest map in the world. The map is breathtaking. The colors as vibrant today as 3,500 years ago. It depicts an epic journey from Egypt to Santorini. The voyage is complete with a terrible storm at sea. Working even further back, we see that the ancient sailors sailed past Egyptian fauna and palm trees in the Nile Delta. The map then follows the river inland and it ends up in a magical city on a kind of river-bound island. This mysterious city is surrounded by high walls with multi-storied houses, elegant ladies peering from the rooftops, and a rich harbor. At the time, there was only one port in Egypt that fits the city in the map, the fabled Avaris. Until late in the 20th century, there was no archaeological proof of contact between Avaris and the Minoans of Santorini. Then, in 1992, perfectly preserved Minoan paintings were discovered at Avaris, proving that in biblical times, this city was populated not only by Israelites, but also by people from ancient Greece. Most people do not realize that there was uh, not only contact between the Minoan world and the Egyptians, it was very intense contact. Uh, uh, contact in trade, contact in ideas. We have the Egyptians referring to the Minoans as the only other civilization that they consider civilized. It was not a military presence in Egypt. It was actually a trade presence. So we now know that there was intimate contact between Greece and Egypt at the time of the Exodus. As a result, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that some of the followers of Moses came from the area of ancient Greece. And it's quite possible that some of these people returned to Greece after the Exodus. The Bible says that Moses and his followers left Egypt with great quantities of swords and Egyptian gold. 3,500 years after the fact, is there any chance of finding Israelite swords and Egypt's golden treasures in Greece? This is Mycenae, 50 kilometers from the coast on the Greek mainland. In 1876, the famous archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann, the excavator of Troy, made a world-shaking discovery at Mycenae. Here, he found 3,500-year-old tombs. The tombs are incredible, with long shafts leading to vaulted ceilings. They were built in the shadow of a mountain that has the shape of a pyramid. Surprisingly, the 
it contained a treasure trove of swords and Egyptian gold. Schliemann believed that the gold belonged to Homer's Agamemnon, who led the war against Troy for the sake of the beautiful Helen. But scholars soon discovered that the people who were buried in the tombs lived about 300 years before Agamemnon. They lived around 1500 BCE. Is it possible that here lie some of the followers of Moses? The answer is on the tombstones that we now know were placed on top of the death chambers. The meaning of the images on the gravestones has never been deciphered until now. If you ask scholars, what is it? They say, well, it looks like a hunt, but there's no animal. Or it looks like a battle, but there's no two people fighting. Let's look at it and let's see what in fact do the grave stele of Mycenae actually testify to if we just look at it very simply, without any prejudice and without any preconceptions. I almost want to whisper some kind of secret because nobody realizes that they have a 3,500-year-old movie, if you will, three frames of the parting of the sea. And they, they don't know it. They don't know it, but look at it. Just look at it. It's so clear. Frame number one, you see waves on top and waves on the bottom. You actually literally see the parting of the sea. And this guy is on a chariot chasing Moses, who's holding a staff. That's frame number one. And right over here, you have frame number two in the movie. The, the water is gathering into whirlpools. And look what's happened over here. Everybody thinks the man with the staff is the loser, but he's actually turned around. He's turned around. He's facing his enemy. He's occupying higher ground. And this guy is occupying lower ground. And look, there's walls of water coming. And in the third frame, which is another museum, even more hidden, you see this guy's been overturned. The water is engulfing them. The horses are upended. And the story is complete. But what do the experts say? In this very example, the options can be mainly two. Either he is a warrior in a battle scene, and he's the enemy. He's chasing the enemy, and the enemy is trying to escape holding his sword. And the second option may be the chariot race scene. So this guy is, uh, this is kind of an ancient Olympics. This guy is an official, and this guy is racing around. Um, he is bearing a sword as well. And he's holding a sword. This doesn't look like much of a sword. It looks more like a staff to me. Yes. Uh, in this case, it's an abstract depiction. It's not a naturalistic depiction. So we cannot say much. To understand what's going on here, all you have to do is actually take this